Painkiller is considered to be one of the greatest heavy metal albums of all times, even by non-Judas Priest fans. Yes, that's true. Released on the 3rd of September in 1990, Painkiller became the 12th studio album by the legendary UK heavy metal band Judas Priest. And so just as we do with every Judas Priest album on the Defenders of the Faith series, let's take a look at some of the lesser known facts about the album which might have actually saved heavy metal in the 1990s. Here you go. By the way, as always, please do not hesitate to comment on anything you hear or see in this video, and especially if I mess up any of the facts, the purpose of this video is of course to start a conversation. But alright, let's do it. It is the only Judas Priest album on which the bass part is actually not performed by Ian Hill only. Don Airy of Deep Purple actually revealed last year that since Ian was unable to participate in some of the recording sessions due to his illness, Don was actually asked to fill in for Ian Hill on some of the bass parts, and so he did. Yet, being a keyboardist, he actually did that on a MIDI keyboard. Band later on merged that recording with Ian Hill's bass and absolutely loved the sound they heard. And listening to the isolated bass parts from, let's say, Painkiller, I can totally understand why. In addition, Dawn of course performed synthesizers on the album, yet because the previous two records, Turbo and Ram It Down, which were quite heavy on synths, received rather mixed responses, the only song on which we can actually hear Dawn is of course A Touch of Evil. And it is an absolute banger. Painkiller is the album of both firsts and lasts. Let's start with the first. It is the first Judas Priest album to feature Scott Travis on drums after Dave Holland left the band in 1989. Good drama. Great look. Good drama. Good, yeah. Good yeah. drama. Since there were a lot of speculations on the matter throughout the years, I think it's worth mentioning that Dave Holland was not actually fired from the band. It was his decision to leave Judas Priest. I'm leaving you. Which of course made Racer Axis Scott Travis very happy because he was trying to become a Judas Priest member for years. Pretty, Pretty good. amazing because I've been a fan for a long, long time and uh, it was great, you know. During the 1986 Fury for Life tour, Scott Travis actually even considered setting up a drum kit in the middle of a parking lot and just blasting Judas Priest songs before the concert, hoping that the band would actually notice. Unfortunately, he gave up that idea and simply went backstage after the show and handed the tape with his demo recordings which most likely got thrown away because none of the Judas Priest band members have any recollections of ever hearing it. Mr. Scott Travis on the drum. I'm actually not going to go into the details of Scott Travis's additions and how he got into the band in this episode, yet I'm more than happy to make a special episode on that matter, so if you think that would be of interest for you personally, please let me know in the comments. But just a couple of interesting facts for now. Despite Scott Travis being a kick-ass drummer, there actually have been a lot of discussions internally in the band about offering him a position because he was not British and Judas Priest is a British heavy metal band. Before joining Judas Priest, Scott Travis has actually never left the United States. And so when he finally got an opportunity and traveled to Southern Europe to record Painkiller together with Judas Priest and realized that there was no McDonald's, 7-Eleven, telephone or a television anywhere nearby, he actually called the place Death Camp 1. I mean, that of course referred only to that little area of where the band was located at that moment. But I think deep down in his heart, Scott actually felt that about entire Europe. <laughs> Please talk more about how you hate Europe and bicycles. Nevertheless, his masterful drumming skills, especially those on the double bass, have won the band over. Scott was the man, you know, he's got the fastest feet in the world, the fastest hands in the world, and that's what we were looking for. And together with Scott, Judas Priest were able to take their sound to an absolutely new level. Now I think we all know what I'm talking about. Honestly, I heard that song so many times and still every time that intro gets my heart racing. By the way, by the time you're watching this, Scott Travis has actually been with the band for longer than all other Judas Priest drummers combined. It was the last Judas Priest album recorded with Rob Halford before he left the band. 
Yet he wasn't the only one who was considering leaving Judas Priest at that time. Bro, what are you talking about, man? In his latest book, KK Downing actually revealed that just days before receiving a letter from Rob Halford about him leaving the band, KK actually wrote a resignation letter himself. Yet the only reason why he did not send it is that after receiving Rob's letter, he thought that the band was simply done and there was no point in doing it. And so I believe it is safe to say that with Dave Holland leaving Judas Priest a year earlier and with at least half of the remaining band members considering leaving the band as well, it is safe to assume that the atmosphere in Judas Priest at that point was not at its highest, even though the band was not really showing it on the outside. Get in the studio late summer, make a new album and another priest masterpiece, hopefully by the end of next year. We're just terrific friends, you know. It's like a marriage, you know, you have your fights, you have your ups and downs, but it's worth saving, so uh, we stick with it. We will not actually cover KK's potential departure and Rob's actual departure from Judas Priest in this episode, because it is still dedicated to Painkiller. But as always, if you'd like a special episode on that matter, please let me know in the comments. Especially given that there is another matter about Rob Halford, which everyone was concerned about. His hairstyle. Yes, from an album to an album, Rob Halford has been changing his hairstyle drastically, and on Painkiller, he finally, proudly went bold. Hooray for Rob, who remains with the same haircut to this very day. Okay, so here I was actually thinking about how I could tie Painkiller to the most recent Rob Halford Instagram post, and I couldn't think of any way, so I'm just simply gonna brag about it. Rob Halford has received our community's little gift, and is now proudly rocking a special custom-made Metal God 70 Metal Pilgrim t-shirt, which I'm extremely happy about. It is the first Judas Priest album since Killing Machine, or Hellbent Forever, depends on how you know it, to not be produced by Tom Allen. Instead, it marks the return of Chris Sangaridis, who worked in a slightly different emploi with the band on Said Wings of Destiny. By the way, Chris is actually not the only thing which ties together Painkiller and Said Wings of Destiny, but we'll talk about that in a moment. According to the legend, in the late 80s, Judas Priest saw a music video on MTV. Yeah, that was back when MTV was still a music television channel. They were absolutely taken by the sound, and when they realized that it was produced by Chris, and knowing that Chris Sangaridis has worked previously with such bands as Black Sabbath and Thin Lizzy, they decided to invite him to produce what was to become Painkiller. Chris was absolutely determined for the band to sound fresh, and for Judas Priest to take their heavy metal to an absolutely new level, which I think we can all agree they did with Painkiller. And thus both Chris and the band agreed that unlike on the previous two records, they would minimize the synthesizer sound, which were still very popular back in the 1990s. Except for on one song, A Touch of Evil, of course, which has ironically been co-written by Chris Sangaridis. By the way, It Is A Touch Of Evil, which became a second single to the album, got itself a video, rotation on MTV, and picked at number 58 in the official charts. Painkiller, of course, picked at number 26 in both the United Kingdom and the United States, and later on was certified gold. Painkiller's iconic album artwork has been once again designed by the legendary Mark Wilkinson, whom all of the defenders of the faith who are watching this series know pretty well by now. The artwork, of course, depicts an angelic creature riding a monster motorcycle coming from the sky, saving the remnants of the civilization, which pretty much destroyed itself. So basically the painkiller himself. The interesting fact, though, is that this painkiller is supposed to be the same angel who was depicted on the Sad Wings of Destiny and who will later on appear on Angel of Retribution. The idea came from Rob Halford, yet originally it had a slightly different concept. According to Mark Wilkinson and his recollection of the events, the angel should have had basically a sidekick of a metallic creature, and the angel himself should have been a pillion rider or maybe even made into a part of the bike. Yet eventually Mark decided to flip the idea in reverse and have a metal angel ride in the motorcycle and turned the sidekick creature into a motorcycle itself. And the chainsaw idea actually came to Mark because his studio at that time was above a hardware shop. After 30 plus years, the artwork of course became one of the most recognizable heavy metal album artworks of all times and has actually recently been made alive. What I personally love about it is that there are so many little details in it that even after 30 plus years after the release, you still find these little things you never noticed before. 
Because of the famous trial, the Judas Priest had to postpone not only being killers release, but also a consecutive world tour. And if you miss out on this, you know, bad luck guys. And since the album has been received extremely well by the audience, Judas Priest actually decided to include almost every track from this record on the setlist. All except for two songs, One Shot at Glory and Battle Him, both of which had never been played live up until a couple of weeks ago when Judas Priest opened with them at Bloodstock 2021. Rock in Confess actually recalls that a couple of weeks before going on tour, he purchased rollerblades and so he thought that it would be an absolutely amazing idea for the entire band to rollerblade on stage during that tour. It seemed like such a simple idea. Stupid, Jack. The word is stupid. And this actually might have been the first time when all Judas Priest members, except for Rob, agreed on something unanimously? Absolutely no. But what the band did agree with Rob on is that they should be taking Pantera on tour with them. <laughs> Funny thing, Pantera got on that bill because of the t-shirt Dimebag Daryl was wearing on one of the interviews while Rob Halford was nearby in Canada. What? Yes, Rob was at the hotel watching the Canadian equivalent of MTV when he saw an interview with some band, Pantera, yet what caught his eye was a British steel t-shirt. Flip the coin, you got a coin? He later on was absolutely amazed by the music Pantera was producing at that time, got to know Dimebag Daryl and actually invited them to go on tour with Judas Priest in the European lag. So here you go, if you want to catch someone's attention, just wear a right t-shirt. Just like wearing a Metal Pilgrim t-shirt if you want to catch Rob Halford's attention at the next Judas Priest show. I mean, just saying. Yeah guys, I'm sorry, I'm really bad at promoting stuff, you know that. But if we actually do want one, let me know. And of course, in addition to having two amazing bands on the bill, the tour for the very first time actually had two Tiptons on the road together. What? Glenn's older brother Gary actually joined Judas Priest on that tour as a guitar technician. And of course, it is on this tour on which Judas Priest had infamously played Hellbent for Leather instrumentally for the only time in their career, since Rob Halford got knocked out and was unconscious for most of the songs on one of the shows. So what is it that makes Painkiller so great? And just before we go on and attempt to answer that question, I think it's no secret for anyone that my personal favorite Judas Priest album is Defenders of the Faith, not Painkiller. And yet Painkiller is flawless. There is not one single weak track on this record, not one song which feels out of place, and not even one plain riff. It is a quintessential heavy metal album which accumulated absolutely everything, all the vigor, all the energy and power that heavy metal had during the 70s and the 1980s. And it also happened to be one of the final big bangs before heavy metal took a back seat and gave in to the new rock genres which emerged in the 1990s. I think it's no secret that 1990s weren't the best decade for metal. It's the were some metal genres which were on the rise during that decade, yet for most part, and especially for traditional heavy metal, this period of time was in fact a period of stagnation. With Rob leaving Judas Priest, Bruce leaving Iron Maiden, and Black Sabbath being, you know, whatever Black Sabbath was during the 1990s, heavy metal gave in to the pressure of grunge and all the other musical styles which appeared during that decade. Yet I'd argue that none of those musical styles which appeared in the early 1990s were able to withstand the test of time, but Painkiller could. And so it happened to be so that Painkiller became not only the final accord for heavy metal bands of the 1980s, but also happened to be the first note of the new heavy metal era, helping the genre re-emerge and reinvent itself in the early 2000s and becoming somewhat of a new golden standard for heavy metal. Hey, hey. This little verdict of mine is of course just my personal opinion on the matter, but what I'm really curious to find out is what you personally think about Painkiller and which song do Judas Priest fans consider to be the strongest from this album and why? As always, please let us know in the comments, I'm very curious to find out. Write that down, write that down! So guys, thank you so much for watching and keep rocking!